Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and this is MedPick's Case of the Week. We have no significant disclosures to report. Our patient this week is a 75-year-old man with a history of coronary artery disease and chronic hypertension. He presents with a sudden onset of right-sided weakness and a sensory deficit. Clinical examination confirms his right-sided weakness. He also has a right-sided facial droop and an expressive aphasia. A non-contrast CT was performed which demonstrates an oval area of increased attenuation in the area of the left thalamus as well as blood in the third ventricle. These are confirmed in the coronal reconstructions which also show a thalamic hemorrhage and third ventricular blood. The MR scan demonstrates a heterogeneous lesion in the left thalamus with an appearance consistent with acute hemorrhage. In addition, the gradient image confirms a susceptibility change due to acute hemorrhage as well as blood being identified within the dependent portions of both lateral ventricles. So this patient has an appearance consistent with an acute spontaneous non-traumatic hematoma in the region of the basal ganglia and the posterior limb of the left internal capsule. So what is our differential diagnosis for a non-traumatic hemorrhage? The list is very, very long, but in the context of the patient's history of hypertensive vascular disease, he probably has a hypertensive intracerebral hemorrhage. Intracerebral hemorrhage is a small subset of all the lesions that are called stroke, representing between 10 and 20 percent of stroke and occurring at a rate of about 40,000 per year in the United States. Primary hemorrhage may occur in the context of hypertension, amyloid angiopathy, and secondary hemorrhage may occur as a result of pre-existing lesions including vascular malformations, neoplasm, or in the context of a coagulopathy or hemorrhagic conversion in a stroke. Hypertensive arteriolar sclerosis is the most common cause of a primary spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage and combined with amyloid angiopathy account for 80% of such lesions. The disease that occurs with long-standing hypertension affects very small arteries with a caliber typically less than 300 microns. The pathologic changes consist of the accumulation of lipohyalinosis, thickening of the small vessel walls, most commonly seen in vessels that are under 100 microns in diameter. In this high power histologic view, we can see the onion skin thickening surrounding the lumen of this small vessel. And this is the classic appearance of lipohyalinosis or arteriolar sclerosis common with hypertension. These hypertensive changes primarily affect small caliber vessels penetrating non-anastomotic end arteries, most particularly the lenticulostriate vessels that supply the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. The same type of hypertensive vessel changes may be seen looking at the patient's fundus with AV nicking, exudates, and small hemorrhages. Small vessels also supply the renal glomerulus and is associated with nephrosclerosis. In the brain, the lesions that occur in the deep gray matter, brain stem, and internal capsule include spontaneous small infarcts, enlargement of the Verkau Roban spaces, etat crible, but spontaneous hemorrhage, as is seen in this case, and also the presence of deep microscopic hemorrhages or microbleeds. Hypertensive hemorrhage, spontaneous hypertensive hemorrhage, typically affects the regions of the basal ganglia and the thalamus, as well as the adjacent structure, the internal capsule. The middle cerebellar peduncle and dentate nucleus may be involved, the pons may be involved, and the cerebral hemisphere, lobar located hemorrhages, each occur at a rate of approximately 10%. If we look at this injected autopsy specimen, we can see the lateral ventricle, the increased vascularity of the caudate nucleus, and the thalamus and lenticular nucleus, and these areas of the brain are supplied by perforating or penetrating branches from the M1 or horizontal segment of the middle cerebral artery. When one of these vessels becomes occluded, we get a small lacunar infarction. When one of these vessels ruptures, we typically get a small self-limited hematoma in the same location.
The basal ganglia and the deep parts of the brain are supplied by these small caliber non-anastomotic end arteries and arterioles that are uniquely sensitive to long-standing hypertensive disease. They become hyalinized, they may rupture, or they may become occluded. In our patient, we had a rupture of a small vessel supplying the thalamus. If we think about why this is associated with contralateral weakness, we can easily remember that because of the decussation of the corticospinal tracts in the brainstem, the patient's left hemisphere controls the right side of the patient's body. So a lesion in this location is perfectly consistent. Primary intracerebral hemorrhages are usually hyperattenuating and relatively homogeneous on an acutely performed CT scan, and they predominantly affect the deep parts of the brain. They may be extension into the ventricle, and the blood may then end up in the subarachnoid space. Non-traumatic hemorrhages, again, represent up to 20% of all strokes. The most common cause is hypertension. Amyloid angiopathy is less frequent. An acute CT scan demonstrates a hyperattenuating lesion. And subacutely, we can have degradation of the blood products, changing their attenuation, changing their signal intensity on various MR pulse sequences, and there may be the development of rim enhancement after a week or two surrounding the hematoma. A chronic hematoma becomes a slit-like cavity with hemosiderin deposited in the rim, which can be easily identified on several pulse sequences on MR. So our patient had a classic presentation of a deep gray matter hemorrhage that also affected the posterior limb of the internal capsule as the result of hypertension. Here are a pair of images in a, another patient who has a deep gray matter and internal capsule hemorrhage, also involving the thalamus. Complications of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, including an expanding hematoma or rebleeding. Watch for the spot sign on contrast enhanced CT. There can be mass effect, herniation and shift, increased intracranial pressure, and extension of clot into the ventricle that may cause the patient to have a fever. The medical management of intracerebral hemorrhage includes controlling the blood pressure while maintaining a cerebral perfusion pressure that is greater than 60 millimeters. If the patient has a coagulopathy, we might want to normalize the clotting factors. The patient may be on oral anticoagulants like Coumadin, in which case we can administer vitamin K. Intravenous thrombolysis has been used. Mannitol is very commonly given acutely. We may want to reduce intracranial pressure by reducing the PCO2 by hyperventilating the patient. And up to 90% of patients with an intracerebral hemorrhage will have a fever during the first three days after admission. This is thought to be related to hemorrhages that involve the thalamus and or the third ventricle or the extension of blood into the subarachnoid space. Seizures may also occur in up to 20% of patients, and the outcome is worse if dilantin is used as the prophylaxis or therapy. Surgical management of intracerebral hemorrhage remains somewhat controversial. It may be indicated in a patient with an acute presentation and a progressive neurologic decline. When the hematoma is on the non-dominant side, surgery may be more favorable. If the hematoma volume is larger than 60 to 70 millimeters, an endoscopic drainage may be the best surgical or operative approach. When the hypertensive hemorrhage extends into the ventricle, the incidence of fever, seizures, and a poor clinical outcome are much higher, as is seen in this patient here, again with the thalamic hemorrhage, this time on the right side. Clearly, there has been extension of hemorrhage into both lateral ventricles. So when we have a non-traumatic hemorrhage, we always think about the diagnostic differential possibilities, including met metastatic disease primary neurologic neoplasms, vascular malformations, or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Remember that acute disseminated encephalomyelitis may also become hemorrhagic, but in this particular case we had a patient with hypertensive small vessel disease. So this has been the MedPix case of the week, a patient with hypertension and a spontaneous hematoma involving the thalamus and the posterior limb of the internal capsule. To obtain CME credit, please visit the MedPix website. I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and I approve this message. Thank you very much for your kind attention.